Hello, BookTube. All right, we're back for another page 112 tag. This is going to be the nonfiction sort of side of the coin of the fiction one that I just did. I've got three nonfiction works here, and we're going to read page 112 of each of them and see what we make of them, see which ones appeal the most. Uh, and as as I did in the last tag, uh, I'm I'm rounding up here. I'm rounding around. I'm, uh, authors have rhetorical periods to their to their writing. Uh, same thing as speakers do when they speak. So I'm not going to come in in the middle of one of those, and I'm not going to cut somebody off either. But this is roughly, uh, this is roughly uh, page 112 in that area. And the first example that we're going to read uh, is going to be familiar to quite a few of you. Uh, those of you who took part in the mandatory Pride and Prejudice read-along, uh, which I'm assuming is all of you, since it was mandatory. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so this is the first uh, segment. Elizabeth's rejection stuns Darcy. No one has ever spoken to him like that, yet it also reveals how thoroughly he engages her. Firm, tactful refusal would have been enough, as it had been when she declined an earlier offer of marriage from the fatuous clergyman, Mr. Collins. But the exchange between Elizabeth and Darcy becomes heated because he attracts her, and she is trying to get through to him to make him see the extent to which he has misunderstood both her and himself. Darcy botches the proposal, but he matters enormously to Elizabeth, even as she furiously protests otherwise. There are as well much bigger issues at stake in Elizabeth's rejection of one of the most eligible men in Regency England. In the 18th century novel, class usually constitutes an unquestioned given. That ends with Austen who in Pride and Prejudice serves notice that traditional notions of aristocratic privilege are now up for debate and open to scrutiny. Darcy has an adamantine belief in his own status as an English gentleman, and he has all the trappings of wealth and social position to prove it. His problem is that he has fallen in love with a woman who simply does not accept that land, money, and rank equal respectability, or that because of them he is entitled to think of himself as her superior. When she, when she tells him that she might have felt more concern in refusing his proposal had he, quote, behaved in a more gentlemanlike fashion, the words literally stagger him. They signal a powerful collision between his elitist assumptions and her bourgeois aspirations. Darcy believes that he was born a gentleman. Elizabeth hopes that someday he might become one. She makes it disarmingly plain, though, that a gentleman is a title he needs to earn, not one he can simply inherit. Ultimately, of course, Elizabeth marries him and becomes part of the privileged world she had previously deplored. But in Pride and Prejudice, she also ushers in the modern world, for she believes in meritocracy over aristocracy, individual preference over dynastic alliance, and female desire over male presumption. Elizabeth is Darcy's future and ours. And I think you'd have to admit that's a fairly spirited reading of Pride and Prejudice, of that one, you know catastrophic scene in Pride and the early part of Pride and Prejudice. And uh, in terms of answering the, one of the key questions of the page 112 tag, which is, would you keep reading? I don't think there's any doubt you would keep reading. That is a very spirited author. Uh, so now, now we'll move on to the second. To, this is the second page 112. And once again, I will, I will approximate the page numbers, just to give us a sense rather than, I don't want to be on, I, I mean, the page 112 tag is unfair to the books under consideration anyway. Inherently it is. I want to be as little, as as fair as that unfair situation makes possible. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're in the middle of things just a bit here, but you'll catch on. Uh, a similar situation faced Aristotle in classical Greece. One would like to acknowledge that motion is essentially something we measure in a relative way. Yet in practice, it is not always easy to actually perform calculations between multiple bodies if they are all in motion. Therefore, Aristotle provided us with a theory in which the Earth is defined to be at rest. Similarly, it is tempting to do all calculations within the solar system as if it were at rest in the ether. But is it really? In fact, in the 18th century, the great astronomer William Herschel showed that the solar system was moving through the system of nearby stars in the direction of a point in the constellation Hercules called the solar apex. The speed of this motion is quite fast, at some 20 kilometers per second. Would it affect the masses of the planets and the sun significantly enough to be measurable in some fashion? Maybe not, but is it even the full speed of the stars through the ether? As we all see, as we shall see, astronomers were just becoming aware that it probably was not. How did one do gravity without knowing something so essential as the speed of one's own motion through Newton's absolute space? Einstein offered a way out of this. He found a way to take the great principle of relativity and embody it after 2,000 years 
in a set of equations that actually worked for any observer regardless of the observer's state of motion. Crucially, when using these equations, the speed of the solar system is completely irrelevant if one wishes to do calculations within the system. Now for an interesting question. How do you explain to people that you have just found the answer to a question waiting two millennia for a solution when they have been walking around the whole time pretending the problem does not exist? The answer is that it will take some time to get through to them. Uh, and that, that is our second excerpt, and uh, uh, you can see immediately some differences between it and the first one. Uh, this is a steeper kind of assumption. The first, uh, the first excerpt that we read assumes that you are familiar with Pride and Prejudice, I think. I don't think that passage would make much sense to you if you weren't. Uh, and this assumes that you are familiar with the concepts of stellar motion in the broadest possible terms. Although I think that even though it is fairly uh, glacial prose, it, it's very clean, very scholarly prose, even though it assumes that, I think it does a fairly good job of orienting you so that you, you don't need to know much more than what's on the page. I'll be interested to hear what you think. Uh, but I think, I think that, that does a fairly good job on a fairly complex subject of getting you roughly to the period of understanding roughly where things were when Einstein's theory of, of relativity came along. Uh, and then we'll go on to the third excerpt, and then we'll, all will be revealed. I will, I will tell you the books, and we'll talk about them a bit more. Uh, so this is the third excerpt. Looking back on the century before Islam, it was as if the pressure had been building from all the migrations and raids and battle days, energies that had to find release if they were not to cause implosion. But that release would come, and moreover, the energies would be channeled. The Arab world the Arab word and the Arab will were about to be gathered. For a while, Arabs would all agree to dream the same dream uh, and to make it a waking reality. The poet Hassan Tabit would soon be eulogizing a new master, not a king, but that obscure yet insightful Meccan, the unsuspecting founder of an empire that would, within a generation of his death, embrace those proud expatriate Yemenis, their much-removed cousins in the Persian-colonized south, their surviving Lakhmid relatives, uh, and astonishingly, briefly, all the perennially bickering tribes in between. In Muhammad, not only would the rhetoric of the tribal unite with extraordinary uh, originality and charisma, the rhetorical roles would amount to much more than the sum of their parts. They would amount to prophethood. A prophet is someone who speaks for a deity. In Muhammad's case, it would be a deity like, who, like those of the old South Arabians, would function as and guide the collective will of his worshippers. The difference was that this deity would suffer no partners, no rivals. He was an uncompromising theological Unitarianism, and for a brief but heady season it would impose another unity, not just of language and culture, but also of doctrine and even of arms. And not just on a settled commonwealth, but on the whole population, of the peninsula, and send them out, Arabs all, from their island. The days of the Arabs, quote-unquote, were far from over. Still, now they came thick and fast, and Ar but Arabs were about to have their day in the history of a wider world. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> I think that's, that's just fantastic. Even in two long paragraphs, that gives you a sense uh, it, I mean, it's, the book is obviously going to go on to explain that sense in detail, but it gives you a sense of what the author describes, of the, these pressures building and building and finally finding it the most unlikely channel of all, a channel that allowed, as, he, as the author so wonderfully puts it, that allowed Arabs to, to briefly dream the same dream. Uh, I, might, I might quibble just a bit <laughs> with either the author's definition of prophethood or the author's application of that definition to Islam. Muhammad does not speak to God, and God does not speak to Muhammad. If the, you, you, can, you can add on an extra layer of fantasy there and say, well, the angel who dictates the Quran to Muhammad is just an empty speaking tube. It is essentially God speaking to Muhammad. You can say that if you want, but it's not. <laughs> it, otherwise, it wouldn't have a name. It's an individual who has a name who, who conveys all of that material. To Muhammad, if if in in the mythology under question, if God wanted to speak directly to Muhammad, God would speak directly to Muhammad. So in this case, it's a, the the prophet involved is not speaking for God. But 
I, I understand completely why the author might not want to get into those weeds <laughs> in one way or another. That passage was extremely eloquent. It was extremely good, I thought. So in terms of the page 112 tag, that would be my favorite. Number three would be my favorite. And probably number two for me would be number one about, about Pride and Prejudice. That, that had a forward momentum to it that I really liked. Although, that's not to slight number three, uh, which would be the second excerpt that we've heard, which I really liked as well. It's just, uh, in terms of, of immediate readability, obviously it, it's dealing with... with uh, physics, so it's going to be a little bit of a slower read. I probably shouldn't penalize it for that, but I want to show you the books now. The first one is uh, Robert Morrison, The Regency Years. His his book in, in which he, he has fallen in love with the Regency period and views it as far more impressive than most historians have done. Credits it with a lot of, a lot of stuff, and of course the linchpin of all of that is the literary achievements of Jane Austen. Then the second book, the second excerpt, was No Shadow of a Doubt by Daniel Kennefick. We saw it on this channel just recently, uh, a book about the 1919 solar eclipse, which many scientists in the world knew was coming. They knew where they would have to go to see it in its entirety, and they also knew what was at stake. The, the, the ones that were familiar with the writings of Albert Einstein knew that this would prove or disprove his contentions about space-time and its effects on light. They knew that they would have a chance, or probably a literally once-in-a-lifetime chance for them, to test this theory. Uh, and this author is an Einstein expert. He's an expert in writing about Einsteinian physics, and I thought that that uh, segment that we read did a really good job of that. A very beginning job, of course. You're going to want to read a lot more. The book has a lot more on that subject. Uh, and then the third excerpt is another book that we've seen on this channel. This is Tim McIntosh Smith, and it's Arabs. This is his enormous book about uh, the 3,000-year history of the Arab world and the Arab language that unites it. Uh, and I was blown away by the book and thought that it was singingly eloquent, just on page after page after page. Tough to do, even a little bit, but to do it so often in such a huge book, my hat's off to him. So those were our, those were our non-fiction page 112 tags. I'd love to know which ones, you know, struck you. Taking into account here my inept reading, I'm not, I'm, I have nowhere near Scott, Sean's skill when it comes to reading prose, or Olive's skill for that matter. I'll have to get them to do one of these one time with nonfiction, just once. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. That's, that, I just want to do a pair of 100, page 112 tags. And I think, I think if I do this next week, if I do page 112 next week, I will also do another pair. I don't like nonfiction feeling left out in the cold. <laughs> so, but anyway, I'll wrap this up for now, and I will be back soon. Thank you, book two.